Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Let me start tonight with a question. At what point can humans put aside their differences to fight a common deadly adversary like the Wuhan virus? The answer, I'm afraid, is none. There is no such point, it seems. At a time when the virus is surging again, infecting hundreds of thousands of people every day the world over and killing thousands, the world is staring at three potential military conflicts, three tinderbox situations that can flare up at any moment. The first, is in West Asia. There was a cyber attack on an Iranian nuclear facility. Iran blames Israel for this. Israel does not deny a role. What will this lead to? Revenge, perhaps, a counter-attack? We do not know. The second is in Ukraine. Russia is deploying soldiers at the border, threatening a full-blown attack. The third is in the South China Sea. Warships and fighter aircraft from China and the US are in these waters. The situation is heating up. Is an exchange of fire inevitable now? We hope not, but we cannot say for sure. But here's something that we can predict. The US, which has a stake in all of these three conflicts, is going to need allies to win. And the US is not going to have allies if it breaches their territories. On Gravitas tonight, we'll discuss what America is doing and what it needs to change. Also on the show, India has approved Russia's Sputnik V vaccine for use. What do we know about this vaccine? Which other shots are in line for approvals? We'll tell you all about it. You may have heard of vaccine shortages too, but have you heard of vaccine cocktails? Is it okay to mix jabs? We'll get you the expert view. In the US, there's no cure for the virus of racism, it seems. Two more videos of attacks on black Americans have come to light, triggering protests and lawsuits. And another leap for the UAE and the Arab world. The UAE has named its first woman astronaut. We'll bring you her story, but we begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. Shops, pubs, gyms and hairdressers in England have reopened after three months of lockdown as the COVID-19 restrictions are eased. Though measures have been in place in England since early January to curb the virus spread, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said the reopening was a major step towards freedom, but urged people to behave responsibly as the coronavirus was still a threat. In Peru, citizens queued up for oxygen instead of voting on the presidential election day in what is being described as its deadliest week of the pandemic. Six of Peru's 18 presidential candidates have contracted the infection. As the military junta's tough crackdown on dissent continues, Myanmar's ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been hit with a fresh criminal charge. Suu Kyi has been charged in six cases so far. Meanwhile, the number of civilians killed as a result of the military crackdown has climbed to over 700, after security forces killed more than 80 pro-democracy protesters in the city of Bago. The global chemical weapons watchdog OPCW has said that Syria's air force dropped a chlorine bomb in a rebel-controlled Idlib region in February 2018. Although Syria and its military ally Russia have consistently denied using chemical weapons, the Syrian government is yet to respond to these charges. 
Days ahead of the start of the holy month of Ramzan, vandals defaced the walls of a mosque in western France with Islamophobic graffiti. French Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin has called the incident an insult to French Muslims and France. Just over 100 days ahead of the planned start of the Olympics amid the pandemic, a poll conducted by local media says more than 70% of people in Japan want the Tokyo Olympics to be cancelled or delayed. 39.2% want the games scrapped, while 32.8% favor another delay. Tropical cyclone Saroja ripped through the stretch of Western Australia leaving a trail of damage, including smashed houses, fallen trees and downed power lines. The Category 3 cyclone, packing wind gusts of up to 170 km per hour, made landfall near the town of Kalbari. NASA's Hubble telescope has captured a striking image of a dying galaxy. In the picture, the faint remnants of the galaxy's spiral arms can be seen in the stretched, thin threads of dark gas encircling it. Hideki Matsuyama has become Japan's first male golfer to win a major and the first Asian golfer to triumph at the Augusta Masters. Matsuyama held a four-shot lead heading into the final round and held off the challenge of Xander Schaufel and debutante Will Salatoris by shooting one over 73. The one-shot victory saw Matsuyama bag his first title since 2017, and he rises to 14th in the world rankings. This year's Davis Cup Finals will be staged in three cities and played over 11 days. The International Tennis Federation has announced that Turin and Innsbruck will join Madrid as hosts for the 18-team event that starts on November 25th. Last year's edition had to be cancelled due to COVID-19. Each city will play host to six countries and two of six groups, with Madrid also hosting the semi-finals and final. The tournament will take place over 11 days rather than seven. More than a year after it began, we are still fighting the war against the Wuhan virus. It's not over yet. In fact, it's getting worse. In the meantime, the world could be inching closer to a real armed conflict. Tensions are escalating in at least three different parts of the globe. <clears throat> I'm sorry, at least three hotbeds of confrontation. Troops are being stationed, warships are being deployed, and over the weekend, we witnessed a cyber attack on a nuclear plant. In West Asia, tensions are growing between two rival powers, Iran and Israel. One of Iran's main nuclear facilities suffered a cyber attack. It is blaming Israel for this, and Israel is not denying it. The second conflict is brewing in the South China Sea. Several weeks ago, Chinese maritime militia swarmed the disputed waters. Now the United States has sent its warships to the South China Sea. The American Navy is conducting drills. The PLA is ramping up its own deployments. The sea is on the boil. The third tinderbox is the Ukraine border. By the end of March, reports say some 20,000 Russian troops were moved to the border with Ukraine with heavy weaponry. Now, one Ukrainian soldier has died in art artillery fire. The situation is tense. These are three different conflicts in three different parts of the world. What is common between them? The United States of America, that is the common link. It has stakes in all the three disputes. So what can Joe Biden do? To start with, not rub allies the wrong way. He's going to need their support. And this is our cover story tonight, what the U.S. needs to do to win the confidence of its allies if it doesn't want to burn its fingers. Let's begin with what's happening in West Asia. Iran has a major nuclear facility in Natanz. On Sunday, it saw a blackout. This is the facility we're talking about. It's a uranium enrichment site. It is located about 250 kilometers south of Iran's capital, Tehran. Now, this site has been very active in the past few years. That's because Iran has been ramping up its uranium production. In 2018, U.S. President Donald Trump walked out of the nuclear deal with Iran, and in response, Tehran started enriching uranium. Enriched uranium can generate power, as you know. It can also be used to make nuclear weapons. So on Sunday, 
A cyber attack happened. There was an outage. Iran has lost a key production facility, at least for the next nine months. It's not going to work. Iran calls it an act of sabotage, and it blames Israel for this. Various sources confirm that the Zionist regime was behind this incident. However, I am pleased that there have been no human casualties or environmental harm. Iran's answer will be to take revenge against the Zionist regime at the right time and place. Iran is also calling this, quote-unquote, nuclear terrorism. Another official said this outage, and I'm quoting again, is a crime against humanity. As I said, it could take nine months to restore production at the Natanz facility. Iran has vowed revenge. What about Israel? What is Israel saying? Nothing. Neither denying a role, nor taking responsibility for the outage. And that is not surprising. This is how Israel operates. It never confirms or denies any such operation. The Israeli media, on the other hand, has a lot to say about this. They're widely reporting that Israel orchestrated this cyber attack. And it gets even more interesting. The Israeli public radio reported that Mossad was behind this operation. Mossad, as you know, is Israel's national intelligence agency. Now, as the radio announced this, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was raising a toast. Look at these pictures. Prime Minister Netanyahu in the middle, surrounded by Israeli military chiefs and Benny Gantz, the Defense Minister of Israel. What do you think they were celebrating? Netanyahu has not taken responsibility for the attack. Perhaps he did not have to. The pictures say it all. But Netanyahu did choose to send a message to Iran from this undisclosed location. The fight against Iran's nuclearization and its proxies, the fight against Iranian arming, is a massive task. The situation that exists today doesn't mean it will be the same tomorrow. It is very difficult to explain what we've done here in this transition from nothingness, from complete helplessness that nothing compares to in the history of nations, to being the world power. Yes, world power, which we've built here. Definitely a regional power, but in certain areas, a world power. The timing of this outage slash attack was significant. It happened on the same morning when U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was in Israel. As he landed, Iran was beginning to report about the blackout. What was Austin's response? A declaration of America's quote-unquote ironclad commitment to Israel. But when he was asked specifically about Iran and the cyber attack, he did not have very much to say. I'm aware of the reports. Uh, I really don't have anything to add on Natanz. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, our efforts uh, to um, uh, engage uh, Iran in diplomacy on the JCPOA, and those efforts will continue, and I'm very obviously supportive of the President's efforts to, uh, to, uh, to negotiate uh, a, uh, a way ahead there, and I'll just leave it at that. So. The cyber attack has put the American administration in a difficult position. A week ago, remember, the United States and Iran began discussing a truce in Vienna. And Israel was not happy about this. It doesn't want the nuclear accord to be revived. It doesn't want Joe Biden to be talking to the Iranians. Now, what is Israel's problem with Iran? In a nutshell, existential. Both countries have vowed to wipe each other off the face of the earth. Now, with this attack or outage, Israel seems to have sent a message to Washington that it is determined to stop or delay any efforts to restore the Iran nuclear deal. The hardliners in Tehran are going to push for revenge. This could complicate any further negotiations for America. 3,000 kilometers away from Iran, another conflict is brewing at the crossroads of Russia and Europe. You're talking about Ukraine. Russia is being accused of massing troops along Ukraine's eastern border. Moscow calls it an act of deterrence and blames the West for curating this crisis and says this is an act of aggression over the likely induction of Ukraine. What is the reality? What is the root of this problem? What is their history? And of course, the biggest question of them all, is a war now inevitable? Here's a report. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Ukraine gained independence and its map looked like this. But today, it looks like this. With the Ukrainian peninsula, known as Crimea, controversially annexed by Russia. 
and the Donbas region in the east increasingly under Russian control. This is where the current conflict is brewing. To understand why, let's rewind to last month. On the 26th of March, four Ukrainian soldiers were killed by pro-Russian separatists. The killings contravened a ceasefire brokered in 2020 and ended a year of relative calm. In the 17 days that have followed, the situation has become quite precarious. Thousands of soldiers have descended on the border. So have dozens of tanks and missile launchers. Ukraine calls it an unwarranted provocation against its sovereignty. We clearly understand the scale of Russian military presence next to our border. I would like to specify that the question of war depends only on Putin. Russia calls it escalated hysteria about a mythical threat. Troops are being transported there. Mobilization plans, calls for reservists are being renewed. Ukrainian media is escalating hysteria about the Russian mythical threat, about plans of Moscow attacking Ukraine practically tomorrow. All this is happening at the behest and open support of Western curators of Kyiv. So both Moscow and Kyiv deny stoking up tensions. Then what exactly is happening and why is it happening? The root of the problem is Ukraine's geographical and demographic makeup. As a former Soviet territory, Ukraine is divided between an eastern region with close historical and cultural ties to Russia and the rest of the country which identifies as more Ukrainian than anything else. The East has been the hotbed of rebellion and pro-Russian sentiment. The rebels allegedly receive support from Moscow and have played a key role in keeping the conflict simmering. Since 2014, 13,000 civilians, 4,100 Ukrainian troops and 5,650 pro-Russian separatists have been killed in this conflict. To put an end to it, the Ukrainian government is pushing for a NATO membership. And this is where things get even more complicated. For NATO and Europe, this means influence on another one of Russia's borders. But Moscow views it as an existential threat. It has billions of dollars invested in Ukraine. A large part of Russian oil exports flow through the country. And, of course, there's a sizable population of pro-Russian people who want to secede from Ukraine. The stakes are quite high. The prospects for a solution, quite low. The implications for Europe, quite severe. And reports of a looming Third World War, quite frightening. <laughs> Bureau Report, we own. World is one. And now to the third conflict we are tracking, China and its aggression in the South China Sea. It's not new, by the way. It just keeps getting worse with time. China began claiming islands as early as 1974. In the years that followed, China reclaimed land in at least seven reefs. It sank foreign ships, engaged in a 90-minute fire exchange with the Philippines, clashed with Japanese Coast Guard, China also militarized islands and deployed missiles, challenged the sovereignty of other nations. In short, it turned the South China Sea into a theater of conflict. We are talking about a vast stretch of water. The South China Sea is approximately 3.6 million square kilometers, and China claims more than half of it. Currently, it is eyeing the Dongsha Islands, also called the New Crimea. Experts say China wants to capture the island by July this year. Let me give you a quick primer. The Dongsha Islands are a part of Taiwan. There are no permanent residents, but Taiwanese Marines are stationed there. The islands are located 275 miles from the Taiwanese municipality of Kaohsiung. 
They're close to Hong Kong, located between China, Taiwan and the Philippines. Reports of China trying to capture these islands emerged in 2020. Taiwan's F-16s began patrolling the area. China sent more drones in response, and then Taiwan drew the line. It said it is going to open fire and shoot down the Chinese drones if required. So why does China want these islands? Basically to make a point, to show that it controls Taiwan. On the 23rd of July, the Chinese Communist Party will celebrate its 100th anniversary. It wants to capture Taiwan's islands to make a point. And Dongsha makes for an easy target. You see, it's small, has a flat geography, which means it is hard to defend, plus it is strategically located. As we speak, a Chinese aircraft carrier has entered the South China Sea. The announcement was made by Chinese mouthpiece, The Global Times. The aircraft carrier is called the Liao Ning. And it's not alone. China has more than 200 military vessels in this region. This is clear provocation. The response has come from the U.S. America has stationed aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt. The flat top was carrying out an exercise in the South China Sea. It was being joined by American assault ship USS Macon Island. There were also destroyers, smaller ships and a cruise, cruiser involved. The American ships carried out a drill just a day before the Liaoning decided to pivot towards the South China Sea. Now, are these two developments related? The world says yes, China says no. It's a coincidence, say Chinese experts. If you ask me, I'd say nothing is a coincidence when it comes to China, including the deployments in the South China Sea. They're there by design. Let's go back to the Global Times article. It speaks at length about a hypothetical war in Taiwan. It says PLA aircraft, aircraft carriers operating on the east side of Taiwan can isolate the island's forces from foreign intervention. Washington's response to this is clear. Any attempt to alter the status quo will be a serious mistake. Listen to this. We have a commitment uh, to Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, a bipartisan commitment that's existed for, for many, many years to make sure that Taiwan has the ability to defend itself and to make sure uh, that we're sustaining peace and security in the Western Pacific. Uh, we stand behind uh, those commitments. And all I can tell you is it would be a serious mistake uh, for anyone to try to change the existing status quo by force. As we speak, the U.S. and the Philippines have also begun a joint drill. It's called the Bali Katan Exercises. The last two weeks involved 1,700 troops from both the countries and will focus on the readiness to respond to crisis. The crisis, of course, is China. So here's what's happening. China is chasing its geopolitical ambitions in the South China Sea. Islands big and small are standing up to it, aided by military powers. The confrontation is building up, and we haven't heard the last of this. So we've told you about three conflicts in one common link, the United States of America. It has a stake in all of these fights. And to win it, it is going to need allies. To have allies, it needs to understand how alliances work. So tonight we bring you a history lesson, mostly for the president of the U.S., Joe Biden. The year is 1945. The Second World War is drawing to a close. The victors have arrived in Yalta, and they will decide the future of post-war Europe. These pictures are iconic. Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, the iron trio that beat Hitler. It was indeed a very powerful alliance, but did it last? The answer, as you know, is no, it didn't. A couple of years later, the Americans and the Soviets began the Cold War. Britain sided with America. For close to half a decade, the two sides fought for global domination. Former allies at each other's throat. So what's the message here? Alliances are defined by adversaries. They're defined by clear objectives. With Hitler gone, there was nothing to unite this alliance. Let me give you another example. Look at post-Cold War NATO. It has struggled to define itself. Who is NATO's villain? Is it Russia or is it China? There is no clarity. Alliances are the key to winning global battles. And this is not just a military notion. Sanctions, diplomatic action, they all work when carried out jointly. But here's the thing about, al about alliances, they're also brittle. National interests keep changing, so do strategic goals. To keep an alliance thriving is hard work. And America's attitude and approach aren't helping it. Look at the recent adventurism near Lakshadweep. The US Navy dropped a big statement midweek. The USS John Paul Jones. 
had sailed in India's exclusive economic zone. Now, this is not some naval patrol vehicle. It's a 9,000-ton guided missile destroyer, a proper American warship. And it was sailing 241 kilometers west of Lakshadweep Islands. For the record, the U.S. did not seek permission for this exercise. They say the warship was checking India's excessive maritime claims. How did India respond? New Delhi protested the naval adventurism not by sending a warship out to Hawaii, but through diplomatic channels, as is expected from a responsible partner. India's position on the exclusive economic zone has been clear. For military exercises involving weapons, consent is required. It's a position that Washington is familiar with, but the U.S. decided to ignore it last week. Now, if you ask the Pentagon, this operation was not targeted at any particular nation state. It was intended to drive home a principle. Listen to this. When we, when, when we talk about freedom of navigation operations, you, you tend to get, you know, we all tend to get focused on, well, it's, it's against a nation state. It's not against a nation state. It's for a principle. Um, and we do it all around the world. It's not just something that, um, uh, you know, we, we tend to talk about it in, in regards to China and their excessive maritime claims. But it isn't all just about China. It, it's something we do not against something, but for something. And we do it all around the world. Well said. Two issues with what the Pentagon spokesman just said. One, John Paul Jones was sailing in India's EEZ. The Navy statement talks about checking India's claims. The target was clearly India. Point number two, the Pentagon spokesman talked about principles. But who set these principles and who asked America to guard them? The only principle in question here is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It guides how states interact on the high seas. And guess who is yet to ratify that convention? The United States of America. Washington is still basking in the glory of a unipolar world, a unipolar order. But the world has moved on. India, Japan, South Korea, these countries have their own democratic experiments, their own culture, their own principles. And Washington is going to have to accept this. Historically, the U.S. has preferred clones over allies. Look at Western Europe, for example. America has rebuilt Western Europe in its image. And it is now trying the same in Asia. But will it work? It's highly unlikely. To beat back China, the U.S. must let regional states take the lead. It must look at the bigger picture. India's EEZ is peaceful waters. There is no comparison with the South China Sea. No disputes, no cross claims of sovereignty. So America did not poke the bear. There was no bear to poke in the first place. Here's the bottom line. The US may be a superpower, but in the Indo-Pacific, it will have to put its allies first. Europe may blindly follow Washington to war, but Asia will not. These are proud democracies with distinct cultures, cultures that have sailed these waters centuries before America declared independence. Joe Biden recently told his allies that America is back. Back to what, we ask? Imposing its worldview on allies. The U.S. must cultivate an alliance of equals. It cannot assume a position of preeminence. Yalta 1945 was not an alliance of equals, so it failed. Remember this, allies use diplomats, enemies use warships. Let's talk about the pandemic. It doesn't look good, no matter where in the world you're reporting from. We'll start with India. Delhi has approved Russia's Sputnik V vaccine for emergency use. It is the third jab in India's arsenal after Covishield and Covaxin. But could this have been done earlier? Sputnik has been approved in 59 countries already. Millions of shots have already been administered. What does this say about India's vaccination drive? A third vaccine to tackle a second wave. India is all set to roll out Russia's Sputnik V. A committee of experts has approved the jab for emergency use. A green light from the national regulator is just a formality now. India has approved two other shots, Covishield, manufactured by the Serum Institute, and Covaxin, developed by Bharat Biotech. The timing of Sputnik's approval is crucial. India is entering the business end of its vaccination drive. Next on the eligibility list is the country's youth, a mammoth demographic of close to 700 million people. 
So a third vaccine will give India an edge. But how is Sputnik V different from Covishield and Covaxin? Sputnik V has a reported efficacy of 91.6%. Covishield's latest efficacy number is 79%. For Covaxin, it's 81%. But experts say don't get carried away by efficacy numbers. Remember, all vaccines are intended to prevent hospitalization and death, not the disease itself. What about the cost? Sputnik is priced at less than $10. It can be stored in conventional refrigerators and, much like Covishield and Covaxin, it is administered in two doses. Ideally, they should be 21 days apart. The Russian developers have signed multiple deals to produce in India. 200 million doses with Virchow Biotech and Stelis Biopharma, 100 million more from Panacea Biotech. Combined, India has the capacity to produce 850 million Sputnik doses per year. For Indian regulators, it is expected to be a busy couple of months. Four more vaccine candidates are waiting in line. Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, Zydus Cadillas vaccine and Bharat Biotech's intranasal vaccine. Reports say they could all get approval by October 2021. What's driving this slew of approvals? Fear of shortages. The world's pharmacy is running out of jabs. India is producing around 70 million doses per month. But India's daily vaccination rate is 3.5 million. That's more than 105 million shots a month. The equation is simple. India needs 100 million doses, but it is producing only 70 million. India has three options here. 1. Spend public money to boost private production. The Serum Institute wants 3,000 crore rupees to expand capacity. The government could oblige. Number 2. Approve more vaccines, like Sputnik V. And number 3. Rope in more vaccine manufacturing centers. We're talking about private labs and factories dedicated to other vaccines. This call must be taken by the producers. There is a fourth, more drastic option to ban vaccine exports. The Global North has already done this. There is domestic pressure to freeze exports, but India is keen to fulfill its global commitments. India's policy was flawed to begin with. Two vaccines for 1.2 billion people was never going to work. The vaccine gifts and exports were added pressure. New Delhi got humanitarianism and politics right. The arithmetic? Not so much. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. Here's the other thing about the pandemic that you must know. The virus is targeting the young too. Look at Brazil. It has more young people in ICUs than old. As for vaccines, Brazil relied on the Chinese vaccine. Now China's own regulator says their vaccines are not very effective. In one out of two cases, the Chinese shot may not even work. 50% efficacy. 70 countries have embraced Chinese vaccines so far, and China is not going to ask these countries to ditch the shot. So it has come up with an idea to keep its vaccines in play. We're talking about vaccine cocktails. China wants to mix two different vaccines. Can one person be given two different shots? Our next report explores the possibilities. Brazil's healthcare system has collapsed. The surge in Wuhan virus cases has gone out of control. This Sunday, Brazil recorded more than 1,800 deaths. The total death toll so far is over 353,000. Latin America's biggest country now has the second highest death toll in the world. And the youth is the prime target of the deadly Brazilian variant. According to a study, there are now more young people in ICUs than old. 
Last month, the number of patients under 40 in intensive care surpassed the old. More than 11,000 people less than 39 years of age are now in ICUs. That is 52.2% of the total patients. Brazil was banking on Sinovac, a Chinese vaccine to pull the country out of its pandemic crisis, but those hopes were dashed over the weekend. A local study found that this shot has an efficacy of just 50.7%. That's barely over the 50% threshold needed for a regulatory approval by the World Health Organization or WHO. After months of silence, China, just for a short while, also admitted that its vaccines are not good enough. The top disease control official of China, Gao Fu, said current Chinese vaccines offer lower protection. But on Monday, he walked back from this statement and the state media went into an overdrive to defend the Chinese shots. Reports say China is now considering mixing two different vaccines to boost their power. The idea is not new. There are others who are exploring this possibility. The United Kingdom is conducting a trial to check if one person can get two doses of different vaccines. In France, the health regulator has already allowed mixing of vaccine shots. Those under the age of 55 who received the AstraZeneca vaccine first can take either the Pfizer or Moderna jab for their second dose. Germany is following a similar policy. Health experts generally agree that mixing vaccines should not be a problem. It is an approach that has been tried before with influenza and Ebola shots, but scientists need more data to be sure if different Wuhan virus vaccines can indeed work together. Bureau report, we on World is One. How will we remember this Wuhan virus pandemic? Surely as a source of great hardships. But in the larger scheme of things, the virus was a pivot, has been a pivot. It did not just change our lives, it turned it upside down. We realize that home can be work and work can be home. Same for schools. Our mobile phones became the rudders of our life, our source of entertainment and our source of livelihood. The pandemic taught us that meet and greet is overrated. Is isolation any better? Well, not really. But the pandemic made us more flexible, more open to changes. They say the post-pandemic world is going to be different. For yes, for us, yes. A lot of things are going to be different. But what about the power brokers of our world, the politicians, the spiritual gurus, the athletes? Will things truly change for them? In most countries, politicians were the first in line to get the vaccines. The virus tested leaders and their credentials. What would their message be? How quickly would they act? Some leaders simply did not have the answers and they were promptly voted out, which brings us to our first talking point, elections. There's one underway in Peru, an election, a presidential election, and this is the scene at polling booths. Massive crowds turned up because voting is mandatory here. Every citizen must vote. Comorbidities and life-threatening conditions are not entertained as excuses. What a great sense of civic duty. Contrast that with Peru's pandemic response. 55,000 reported deaths and a health system in complete collapse. They're lining up for oxygen. 18 presidential hopefuls were in the fray. Six of them ended up getting the virus. Maybe these public rallies had something to do with that. Lockdowns for people, but rallies for politicians. And it's not just Peru. It's election season in India as well. Every single political party had staged public rallies. Thousands of people attended these rallies right in the middle of a second wave. Elections are important, yes. No one, nobody's denying that. But campaigning must be responsible. Right now, everybody seems happy working from home except the politicians. Keep the mask on, say the courts. Even if you're alone in your car, because your car is a public space. No such rules for election campaigns, clearly. Our second talking point is religion. It's given solace to millions in these tough times, but it has also given us scenes like these. This is the Kumbh Mela in India's Haridwar. Nearly a million devotees are here. 
all of them heading to the banks of the Ganga, taking a dip in the river during this time. It is considered auspicious, but there are concerns. And looking at these pictures, it is clear what those concerns are. No masks, no social distancing, and one common body of water. It is a guaranteed super spreader. So elections unchanged, religious events unchanged. What about sports? Have the so-called bio-bubbles worked? More importantly, are they really necessary? Right now, India is hosting the biggest T20 league in the world, the Indian Premier League, the IPL. It is being played behind closed doors, yes. Only a handful of stadiums are hosting matches. Even with such strict measures, a few players have caught the virus. What if the cluster expands? Remember, it's not just the players inside bio-bubbles. There's a huge support team, umpires, ground staff, broadcasters. Just last week, 14 members of the broadcast team tested positive. So here's the question. Is the IPL essential? It depends on how you look at it and whom you ask. For the sponsors and the cricketing board, yes, it is essential. But in the middle of a second wave, the risks are just too high. Not just cricket, club football, basketball, baseball, they've all returned, some with limited audience. There's a reason they call it a bio-bubble. It is not ironclad. One let up and we could have a full-blown crisis in Indian cricket. So what's the solution here? It's simple. Rule of law. Let me tell you what happened in Norway recently. The Prime Minister was fined more than $2,000. The Prime Minister, she was fined. Why? Because she hosted a birthday party that violated virus control rules. And the Prime Minister apologized and agreed to pay a fine. End of story. Ten people were allowed in a gathering. She hosted 13. This spirit must be replicated everywhere. Politicians must be held accountable for their massive rallies. Sports administrators must answer for staging these massive leagues. The virus infects without discrimination. So our response too must be without blinkers. Now we've said this in the past. Racism in the United States of America is not an exception. It is the norm. Two incidents have now come to light as a reminder of this grim reality. The first is from the state of Virginia, where two white policemen pointed guns and pepper sprayed a black U.S. Army officer for a missing license plate. This happened in December. A lawsuit has now been filed. And the second incident is from Minneapolis, where a black man has been shot and killed by the police. Why? For a traffic violation, shot at for a traffic violation. In any other country, these violations would lead to a fine but clearly not in the land of the free, where the color of your skin seems to increasingly determine the severity of your crime. And the timing here is very important. These incidents are being reported and discussed at a time when Derek Chauvin, the white police officer, is on trial for the murder of a black man, George Floyd. Open the door slowly, step out. This is not an encounter. Yeah, you, you should be. Get out. This is Get a out. traffic stop. Get out the car. Get out now. Hold on. Watch it. Watch it. The criminal. Get out of the car now. He is a lieutenant, lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and a black and Latino American driving his new SUV with a temporary paper plate by two cops. What followed was sheer racism. Camouflaged as obstruction of justice. Really? Get out of the car now. Get out of the car. I'm actively serving this country, and this is how you're going to treat me? I didn't do anything. Whoa, hold on. What's going on? Hold on. This footage was shot in December, but a lawsuit in the case has been filed now. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Please talk to Get me. Get on the ground now. On. You know this is tough. Certainly. Lay uh, flat. This is tough. I can't believe it being treated like this. Nazario has sued the two cops for their behavior. More than a thousand miles away from Virginia, in the state of Minneapolis. Another black American couldn't even opt for legal recourse. He was shot and killed by police officers for a traffic violation in Minnesota. The incident took place barely 16 kilometers away from where George Floyd was killed. Our early reports was that one officer had fired 
a weapon, uh, striking the driver. Uh, the vehicle continued and eventually crashed. Uh, and um, medical resources were then deployed to uh, the scene uh, to aid the people in both the vehicle that was crashed into and the original group. Uh, the driver of the vehicle was, uh, was deceased. The aftermath seems like deja vu. Hundreds of locals have descended on the streets of Minnesota. There are protests, there's tear gas, and the same rallying call. Black Lives Matter. Who knows if there's going to be a difference in this world? Who knows if it's going to be the last time that we all come together in something like this? As the protests continue, the trial of Derek Chauvin over George Floyd's death is yet to reach any conclusion. It's been three weeks and the jurors are still analyzing the testimonies. Whatever be the final report, the chances of it eradicating America's virus of racism seem abysmally low. Please talk to me about what's Get going on. Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! Please talk to me Get about what's going on. Get on the ground! Viral report, Vion, World is One. Let's end the show tonight with a story of hope. A woman in the United Arab Emirates is about to break the glass ceiling in space. Her name is Noura Al-Matrushi. And she has been selected to train as an astronaut. Once the training is complete, Alma Trushi will be the first Arab woman to venture into space. Her selection is historic, not just for the Arab world, but for women around the globe. Here's why. Her name is Noura Almat Rushi, and she has been selected to train as an astronaut. Once the training is complete, she will be the first Arab woman to enter space. Her selection is not just historic for the Arab world, but for women around the globe. Here's a report. Meet Nora Al-Matrushi, a member of the second batch of the UAE's astronaut program. Space was Nora's passion since childhood. She is now going to live it. The 27-year-old has been selected as the Arab world's first woman astronaut. The announcement of her selection was made by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid himself. The ruler of Dubai revealed that Nora was selected from a pool of 4,000 applicants. She will now head to Texas to undergo training at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Born in 1993, Al-Matrushi holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. She is a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and has a proven record of excellence in the scientific field. Her selection is historic, not just for the Arab world, but for women around the globe. The space sector has been male-dominated since its early days. As of 2020, at least 566 people have traveled to space. But out of this, only 65 are women. That's 11.5% of all space travelers. The first woman in space was Russian cosmonaut Valentina Treshkova, way back in 1963. But since then, only a few women could become astronauts. America sent its first woman in space only in 1983, Sally Ride, who flew aboard the space shuttle STS-7. The inclusion of Nora Almatrushi in UAE's space program attests to the Sheikdom's commitment to increase gender equality in all sectors. And it comes as a ray of hope for women around the world looking to venture beyond Earth. Your report, we own. World is one. With that, it's a wrap. We're leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.